Awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Cynthia Emerson, and I am the DARE Program Manager. Also joining me from Canary today is Tom uh, Vitez, Senior Director of Applications, Don McCullough, the DARE Solution Architect, and Eric Whitmanis, our uh, Marketing and Communications. So welcome and thank you all for attending today's webinar, one in a continuing series that we host quarterly. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available online. We will also be making available a PDF version of the presentation. If you have a question you'd like to ask during your presentation, please go to the participant uh, menu in the Zoom menu and raise your hand and we will unmute you. We will also provide time for Q&A at the end of your presentation where you'll be able to use the question and answer facility to type your questions as well. Bienvenue et merci à tous de participer au webinar de la Terre d'aujourd'hui. Cet webinar est l'un d'une série qui nous prévoit d'organiser tous les trimestres. Cet webinar est présentement enregistré et sera disponible en ligne. Nous mettrons également à la disposition des participants une version PDF de la présentation d'aujourd'hui. Nous aurons des pauses tout au long du webinaire pour les questions et réactiverons tout le monde afin que vous pu puissiez poser des questions. S'il vous plaît, utilisez la fonction du message questions et réponses du menu pour nous soumettre votre question à tout moment et nous y aurons pendant les pauses de QAR. Thank you. So Eric, next slide. So a few, uh, a few a few new updates and news. We're going to touch on a couple of updates and a little bit of news. And then the main, uh, the main star of the day today uh, is the presentation from Dawn. So with that, we will jump straight into the updates. Um, we, uh, we've been busy. We've been out there having a really good time getting out and meeting with uh, folks in the startup and uh, small and medium-sized business community. And I've been working on several events with accelerators and incubators. So I just wanted to, uh, to let you guys know that if you're out there and you're working with a, an accelerator or an incubator and you think there'd be a, an opportunity for us to come and work with your group or engage uh, to, to learn more about how we can support each other and you, uh, please reach out to me directly and, uh, and let me know uh, who I can connect with uh, at an incubator or accelerator near you. And part of that is we've been putting together not only these incredibly um, wonderful uh, technical webinars that we've been doing for you folks, but we've been putting together a list of additional webinars, uh, both with our partners in the community and just within the DARE community here at Canary to have some guest speakers come in. So let us know if there's people that you would like to have come speak to you or topics that you would like to hear about because we will be uh, augmenting our webinar series to include uh, guest speakers on a variety of topics. Um, and with that, we will probably poll you about that. We do have the Slack poll uh, feature that we had talked about uh, the previous uh, webinar available. We put one in there for you folks uh, earlier this week asking about booster packs. We are busy at work uh, reviewing some expressions of interest and looking to figure out what the right combination of booster packs are for our community. So please take a moment if you haven't already to jump into the poll. It's literally right in Slack. You just have to, to let us know what would be the most value to you in your business. And we'd really appreciate your feedback. And with that, a bit of a sneak peek. Uh, we are, as we said uh, last, uh, last meeting as well, we do have the Kubernetes automation toolkit ready to go almost, almost. Uh, we're just in the final stages. So uh, we will be uh, looking to schedule a webinar in mid, early mid, mid, I'm sorry, I just forgot the date. Eric, can you jump in? I think it's the 18th of February, but we'll, we'll firm that out. We'll get you an invitation shortly, but uh, look for the Big Bit uh, Bus webinar on their, uh, their Kubernetes booster pack coming soon. Next slide. And talking about the booster packs, I do want to take a moment to remind everyone that it is now available online, the expression of interest. So if you are interested in learning more about the booster pack builder um, opportunity, please reach out to me personally directly. I'd be happy to talk to anyone who's interested. Uh, but for more information or to submit your expression of interest, it is now fully available online on our Canary uh, DARE website. Just a reminder that we do um, provide some funding for our booster packs, $50,000 Canadian. 
Uh, and like I said, if you'd like to learn more or want to set up a quick call with me, by all means, just, uh, just reach out and let me know. Next slide. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Dawn to talk about some uh, exciting new features that we now have available in the Morpheus 4.2.6 update. Dawn? Awesome, thank you. Good day, everyone. So today we're gonna to be covering one of the features that has been added into Morpheus. Uh, there will be more of these sessions on new features as well. Um, Today we'll focus on setting up a Docker cluster and setting up uh, and using that cluster uh, with containers. All of this can be done within the interface now and we'll take you through all the details you'll need to use it. Okay, so I think you can see my screen now. And you should see the dashboard uh, interface. This is the, the view you get when you log in. Basically, uh, the fundamental problem that most people have is setting things up right. Uh, the one point I wanted to address right up front is when you come into your account for the first time and you see this dashboard for the first time, there'll be no recent activity. All these will be zeros and you'll be like, okay, let's get started. Let's put something down. But you need to come up here. You need to set your user settings. You need to make sure that these user settings are set up for the Linux process. Uh, this handles Linux logins and it creates the accounts on the Linux instances when they're deployed. This does the same for Windows, creates a user account for you in Windows and sets the password for you in Windows. You then need to also come here to administration after you've saved this stuff and go to provisioning. You need to set up the cloud init settings for your Unix environment. And you need to set up the Windows administrator password for your Windows environment or you will not have any control over your Windows environment. With that said, <clears throat> let's get on to clusters. So clusters is a technology you'll now find under infrastructure clusters. This is a start of setting up one of many cluster uh, technologies. Right now, we're gonna cover Docker. Um, with Docker clusters, you can set them up in AWS or Azure. I have one set up for us to use because they take a little while to deploy. It's deploying uh, the whole cluster infrastructure, setting up servers, uh, setting up workers, configuring them all. It takes about 25 minutes, I wanna say, 20 to 25, uh, a bit longer uh, in some cases than others. So you just have to let it do its thing. I'll show you how to add a cluster and I'll take you through until the point where we click deploy. Uh, so you are aware of all the things you need to do. Click add cluster here. The cluster we're working on today is Docker clusters. As you see, there's many other options here. We're gonna get into covering some of these other options and how to use them and uh, in, in future webinars, I should say. Okay, Docker clusters. So when you set up a Docker cluster, this is your first window and it's basically asking you to pick the cloud you wanna use. AWS or Azure. Docker clusters are not supported by the Dara tier GPUs. The reason is you're only allowed one of them. And uh, if you want to do Docker on a GPU, it's a much more complicated process. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna pick Azure today because uh, I picked AWS last time. Uh, next cluster name, and we'll call it uh, demo. One, resource name, we need to set this. And it should be something you remember because every time you deploy a container, you're gonna to have to deploy it to this resource group. So what we're going to do is we're gonna call this demo-cluster. dash 
next. And we saw, then we select the, the plan. Now the plan here, two things about, about setting up your plan. First is don't go, let's go big or go home because that's just not gonna work for you. The, uh, the result of that is going to be big expenses. Um, you, your expenses are controlled in, in the, the DARE environment, so don't worry about that. But think about how many containers you're gonna need to run, what they need resource-wise to run, and then think about uh, how you'd want to break that down across hosts to get redundancy over time. Give that some thought before you pick your si your plan size. Uh, in our case, I'm gonna say one core and 1.7 gigabytes is lots because I'm only gonna deploy one container. Uh, you may be deploying two or three and you need to look at the container and how each container uh, uses resources to achieve the goals you need and then set up things to support that. Resource group, uh, resource pool uh, is their test tenant. That's fine. And network is their test tenant. Security group, use your default security group. And availability set, we're going to say no availability set. Availability set is basically setting uh, each instance you deploy into uh, a separate availability set so that they're guaranteed to be on different hosts in Azure. And the other piece of information we need give me one second here. Yes, that's correct. Um, and not user config, advanced config. No, nope, we're all good. Next. Sorry, I was just getting, um, I set up a new resource group in the previous demo, but um, I haven't set that, I haven't um, clearly uh, done that yet. So it's okay. Um, and then all you would do to complete that is complete. So that's getting a cluster set up. Now we have a cluster set up in AWS and Azure. To set up a container to that cluster, you simply come here to instances, to provisioning instances, you add, You go to Docker. If you don't have a cluster, you'll see this is grayed out. That's because it needs a cluster to actually work. Next, uh, we're gonna start with AWS, but then we're gonna spin Azure as well. And we're gonna name this Docker Demo AWS One. And next. We're gonna lay out a single container, 128 megabytes of RAM and one gig of storage. Lots of room on our server for that. Resource pool, we're gonna pick the AWS Docker cluster. That's where, you, remember when I said, pick something you'll remember in our, de in our demo of deploying a cluster that's where I got confused because the resource pool didn't reference the one I thought it was going to. That's okay, because I was setting up a new one. <clears throat> uh, Docker image here, if you're not sure what your image is named, you can go to uh, Docker Hub and you can uh, search for the image you want to deploy. In our case, I know Apache is HTTPD. And of course I want the latest because I want all the most current patches. And the registry I'm picking is Docker Hub. You can set up in your account a, a separate Docker Web registry and use that if you have it. 
It's not set up by default. Docker Hub is, is the default. Um, and then the host that you want to run that on is the AWS Docker cluster. So all clear, we move on. Next. We don't need the backup service or anything like that for this demo. You can set up backups during the deploy or afterwards. <clears throat> and then we take a look, everything is all set and we complete. While that's spinning, we're gonna add one more. We're gonna add Docker, Docker host and we're going to pick Azure. And we're gonna call this demo dash docker dash Azure one. And next in Azure, the resource pool is now the AZ cluster demo, which is what I was expecting uh, earlier. Docker image, HTTPD. An easy cluster. You know what? In AWS, I deployed one that would get me a trouble ticket. You need to come down here to advanced options and you need to tell, in this case, uh, Docker, what port to open up? Oh, 80. And next, next, and complete. And this is the whole trick. If you make a mistake, you delete it. Let's quickly go up here and deploy one more container. And we want AWS, Docker, dash demo, dash, AWS dash one. And next, our resource pool. Options and put in. There we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is point out a couple of things. One, when we click on Azure and we see our Docker container up and running here, we get a location. We're gonna need that location. And we're going to pick a new tab. Or we're going to say HTTP. And that location. And that should bring up the success page. Oh, no, it does not. I wonder why. Hey, Don, I think you uh, <laughs> put the number 80 in the name of the uh, advanced port instead of calling it HTTP and putting port 80 to open up. Yes, I did. And this, this takes us to the, the point of how do I tell what is going wrong? And that's a good catch, Tom. If I come to console here, it's gonna take me to the container. Oh, 
Well, that's not going to tell me why port 80 is not open. But if I come to click on this cluster demo, host, and I click console, because I set my username up right, it will automatically log me into that host. And then I can do a sudo space, oh, no, no taps. Yes. Okay. Docker says it's got port 80 open, but it's not mapped to anything. Okay. Tom is right. What I did here was make a mistake. And we're gonna correct that mistake. And that once again is Azure. So we take Azure. Containers are easy. Don't do something right, delete one. Wanna fix it? Do it right the next time. Demo dash docker dash Azure one. Change to Azure. That was defaulted to AWS. Oh, gotcha. Add Docker Azure. <laughs> Resource pool, Azure demo. Docker image, HTTPD, server, AZ demo, everything is correct. Name, HTTP, port, 80. And next, and next, and complete. Okay, now we know that that AWS host, we didn't make that mistake on, but you'll notice the external port gets mapped to a funky port. That is the, the way of things inside this environment because we cannot know what ports are open on the host at this point in time. And we've got to be able to deal with the situation of multiple web servers on a single host. Each host gets a, a custom port. Now you can point to your DNS um, to address this, um, but the reality is, is that this is the way it looks. So what you do is you come in here and you grab this location and command C. And that becomes your port number for your application. And so if we do that and we hit enter, it works. Our AWS side is doing what it's supposed to do. And if I come back here and I click into this Docker cluster and I go console, once again, I'm at the cluster again. I can do a docker, uh, sudo docker ps, and my password. And you'll see that external port is mapped to that internal port now. That's the way it should look. Come to my instances and go to Azure. This is how quick Docker containers are up, just fast, and quick, I can do grab that location, 
in that V and it works. We're up on the Azure side too. A little bit more on troubleshooting. There's a few tools that are available to you um, that can really help in figuring out what's going on. One of them is, go, come in. let me come back to the instance view again. You've got each of your containers up here. And if you want to know more about what's right, what that container is doing, you can click on the container and you can click on logs and it will tell you the Docker logs for that container. And the reason it cannot set up a fully qualified, it cannot verify a, a quote, fully qualified domain name is because we haven't configured Apache yet. So if you want to configure Apache, then at this container level, you can come in here, click on console, and you are at the Apache directory. You can move around within here in the container and the default setup for a container um, in Docker Hub, they will tell you how they've set it up. Apache sets you up to log in as a root. Other containers have special usernames and passwords they have. Uh, you may be challenged for a password before you log in here, um, before you can get to this view, uh, depending upon the container. So look in Docker Hub at the details on the container to get the details of how things work. Uh, but in general, this is the container view and you can do things uh, that help you build a container. And you can go cd4 slash etc for slash Apache. No, I need to look at the documents and see how this container deployed uh, Apache. Uh, looks like uh, it's a custom setup. So it's really a matter of, we just got to find Apache and uh, on here and we can configure it. Now, if you want to know what's going on at the host level, then you can pick the host. And the way that looks, just so you're clear, is at this level, if you want to get to the Azure host and see what's going on in the Azure host, then the issue, right here, under the host, you've got the container name and the host. You've got to come here to the host and then you can click on console on the host and you'll get logged in as the host level. One of the things that I recommend is patching. Security patches are done, but the regular patches need to be I think I've covered the basics, covered some advanced technical challenges. So let me know if you have any questions. Uh, that's perfect, Don. We do have some questions coming in right now. Uh, okay. Stephen would like to know, he, right now he's using Dare to figure out what resources he needs for his production environment. So he <laughs> wants to know how you go about changing an existing VM. Provisioning instances. At the VM level, if you want to tweak the size or the storage space on an instance, then you basically uh, click on the instance that you're working on. I'll pick another instance that's not a, a Docker container because that'll uh, give you a better sense of things. And then when you're at the instance level, and the way you know you're at the instance level is that uh, it says host up here. So we're not at the instance level yet. We need to come down here to this instance level. Now we're at this level. This is the actual VM in the cloud. You can come here and you can click reconfigure. And when you click reconfigure, you'll notice this warning. You can go up, but you can't go down. So 
take a backup of your instance before you do this. But here's the trick. If you want to change the root disk, you can do that. I'll warn you, if you change the root disk, you're going to cause an outage to your system because they're going to have to reboot it. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. <clears throat> you can add a network to your, uh, your instance as well. Um, that's a little bit more complex. Maybe I'll make that a topic sometime. But uh, when you want to add, say you want to add a volume, then you can add a volume. What will happen with that volume is you'll see in my documents I show, uh, for getting started with there, I talk about mounting an external volume um, and you can uh, use that process to mount this new volume. You can find it, but what'll happen is it'll be attached to your instance. Your, your Linux box will know about it or your Windows box will see it as a disk but you will not, it will not be attached in, in Windows. It won't have a drive letter um, and it won't be formatted. It'll just be a raw disk. In Linux, it's the same. It'll show up in forward slash dev forward slash the device name, but it will not be formatted and it will not be mounted. You'll have to take care of that. And I provide instructions on how to do that. Um, if you want to change the, the size of your instance, say you started off with a one core and one gig of memory, and you want to change the size to two cores and four gig of memory, you can do that. What's going to happen, though, is you're going to have an outage. Your boot, the, the instance is going to be taken offline, it's going to be snapshotted, and then it's going to be spun up in the background as a larger size instance, and the old instance is going to be deleted. So make sure you take a backup before you do these things, but that's how you resize both the instance, the root disk, just change this number and click reconfigure. And adding a volume, you just add one, reconfigure, but remember you gotta format that volume. Well, you gotta find that volume in the OS, you gotta format that volume, and then you gotta mount that volume, or in Windows, you gotta give it a drive level after you formatted it. Perfect. Thank you, Don. We do have another question coming in from Stephen. Sure. Uh, wondering about uh, what advanced options are open to him and where you input your own YAML. Where you input your own YAML. Okay, so there's several ways that you can uh, automate an instance deploy with YAML. Uh, one of those ways is that you can come up here to provisioning and you can come to automations. And if you, uh, you can set up a task uh, that you can then add to your instance during the time. In the types, you've got all these types available to you. So you pick the, the, the type that basically suits you. That you're not gonna be able to use YAML. Most of this is for bash scripts and stuff like that on Linux and PowerShell scripts on Windows. Workflows can be used and you can add a provisioning or an operational workflow. In this case, we probably want a provisioning workflow. And then you can add your task here. So basically you can create a task if it's bash or, or PowerShell or many other variations, but not YAML. And you can do an automation that way with a workflow. The other way that you can go is blueprints. You can create a blueprint for yourself. And type in this case uh, would be Morpheus if you want to use YAML. And next, and here you can add infrastructure. So we'll say app and say you want to automate uh, an Ubuntu because they're my favorite. <clears throat> and add, and we want it to be an AWS.
click on that. We can come down here and we can describe an instance as we want. And this is what I wanted to point out to you though. If you click on raw, we're not done yet. You'll notice our default is YAML. So if you want to automate your whole process, want even use the builder to build out to the point where you get an instance, you know, select your instance type and then save that. Um, then once that's done, you can add your, your um, YAML below that, or you can plan this instance deploy so that it uses tasks that you've created right here in automations. You can even set security group rules for that before you get started. You'll see by default, we always have SSH in there. Hopefully that helps. So Don, um, just to close off the concept of uh, workflows and automation and uh, blueprints. So blueprints can be used to define a default VM with default applications and configuration. Um, yep. But if you want to create something from that blueprint, you do that under apps hmm. to create. Yep. Yeah. So basically, once you have a blueprint created, then you add an app and your blueprint will be listed here. You select, you'll see that our booster packs are all blueprints, um, but you can add your own blueprint that you've created. And then next, uh, I'll use Blue Waves next. I'm not going to go all the way. You give your app a name. In this case, it has to go in Dare GPUs because that was the only option they provided you in the blueprint. Uh, and next. And you'll see you'll get a similar view, but you'll have less control. <laughs> you can't edit things, you can just use things. And they, these locks are used to allow you to be able to select the things that they want you to select. and not select the things that they don't want you to select. So if you want to build an automation that's very tightly controlled, you can do that. And you see, if you set up an automation as they have, then there's that, that task is, is set to automatically run in the blueprint. You click next. And all I have to do to deploy that is complete, but I'm not going to do that. So yeah, using blueprints to template a specific, a special purpose VM is easy to do. And then it's very fast for you to spin up one of those VMs with that default application configuration, ports open to whatever users yep. created, whatever you want to do. And uh, that's a, a pretty powerful way of doing things. Um, the other way is through the workflows and if you're spinning up a, a regular Ubuntu instance or something, but you've already defined a workflow for a specific reason to do something during provisioning or post provisioning, you can create workflows to run those automation scripts at various stages of deployment as Don showed earlier. Thank you very much for that, both uh, Tom and Don. Uh, I, I'm not sure if this was just answered and what you guys were explaining, but Stephen was asking about um, about the blueprints and how he can bring blueprints he's made in Morpheus, and how he can bring that over to a production version in AWS. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the code would be usable, uh, but it would have to be adapted to AWS YAML format. Um, AWS has got their own format. Uh, it is it is very similar, uh, but it would require uh, you to tweak your code to match the AWS YAML requirements. So the, the shortcut there, I guess, Don, is to go into that 
blueprint um, dialog and select the raw tab and select everything in the raw yep. YAML of the blueprint yep. and then paste that into your production environment in AWS and then just uh, tweak anything that needs to be updated, correct? Correct. So if I add an app again, uh, just to add some details here, just so I've got something to work with. And then I click raw. See, I can just grab this or I can export it and download the configuration. Then you can tweak it for eight and there you go. It's downloaded. And then I can just do whatever editing I want. I can take the same app I built and, and convert it to an AWS YAML format in very short order. Now, uh, Stephen, as a follow-up to that, in order to save possibly the effort of having to tweak any back code, is there a way to use Morpheus in production to save that effort? Um, there is, but Morpheus is a commercial app. So you need to look at the costs of that as part of your infrastructure costs. Um, it is a third-party application that uh, you can buy uh, licenses for as a, as a company, no problem at all. Yeah, I, I see your question and your point, Stephen, and I, I agree that, you know, it, it can be cumbersome, but um, the reason why Canary chose to uh, leverage the Morpheus cloud broker tool is because we wanted to provide our uh, entrepreneurs and Canadian small medium businesses access to uh, more than just one cloud. So we wanted you to be able to have access to experiment in Amazon AWS as well as Microsoft Azure um, so that you, know, you could try your applications in both uh, public cloud offerings, determine which ones perform better and at a lower cost so that when you exit out of the DARE program, you can make an intelligent business choice where it's uh, you, up to you now to deploy this application in uh, your own uh, cloud account, whatever performs the best and at the lower cost for you. So the reason why we have this broker tool is to make it easy to and fast to develop and test and deploy to whatever cloud uh, Dare makes available to you um, and, and make it easy. I understand that it, it complicates things when you want to migrate over to your own personal cloud account in one of these public clouds, but that's the trade-off. We also needed a tool that would help us quickly and easily manage uh, hundreds of Dare tenant accounts and across multiple clouds like we have our OpenStack private cloud, AWS and Azure. And if we had to uh, create accounts or sub accounts in each of those three accounts using each of those clouds native tool sets, rather than using the broker tool, it, you know, it's with a small team, we just wouldn't be able to keep up. And, and so that's what, what also helps us on the admin side. So I hope that clears up your question. The other thing I would point out is that um, the, the challenges of, of automation within cloud environments is you're constantly deploying in new technology, constantly tweaking new technology and constantly learning a new language. Um, it just is what it is. Perfect. So I believe that's all the questions we have um, asked at this point. If anyone else has any other questions about uh, what Don showed up today, please type them into the QA panel now. Um, and if uh, there are no more questions, then uh, we'll move on with a wrap up.
All right, that looks to be the last of the questions. So um, Cynthia, over to you for the end of the webinar. I was talking on mute again, getting used to the work from home webinars. Uh, I was saying thank you, Don. That was very informative. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Eric uh, for managing the questions. Uh, if there are no other questions uh, or things for, from the audience, then we'll wrap up. And uh, just a quick reminder, please drop into the Slack uh, channel to answer our, uh, our poll if you can. And also please feel free to use Slack to start and communicate with me. Um, we are looking, as I said, to expand our topics. So if you have anything you'd like to see uh, us talk about or topics of interest that you think we should be looking at, please, uh, please just let me know. And as I said, our next one will be uh, in February when we'll be introducing you to our brand new booster pack. So with that, uh, have a wonderful rest of the week, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next time.